If you will, open your Bibles to Matthew 21, verses 28 through 32. Oh, my preacher, we're going to be here forever. I, I got up here even later last week, so um, I've got a, 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 a very touching Valentine's uh, story I want to share with you first. And uh, the story goes like this. Uh, oh, before I do that, uh, my my very, very dear friend, Captain Hook, is back here, uh, joined us today, too. I don't know why he's sitting so far in the back of the building. I guess he figures I'm going to preach a long time. But he drove an hour to be with us in our service. He and Shirley uh, were a, a very big fixture here when they lived in Wheeling, but they moved to the beach and then, for some crazy reason, moved back. But they live all the way up in Wellsburg now, but he, he wanted to join us in the service today. Uh, Brother Reggie, I love you. And uh, he worked with me for a number of years and still came to church here. So, wow. Uh, anyhow, this is a, I want you guys to really pay attention uh, to this very touching uh, story I'm going to share with you. It said a few minutes before the church services started, the townspeople were sitting in their pews and talking. Suddenly, Satan appeared at the front of the church. Everyone started screaming and running uh, for the front entrance, trampling each other with a frantic effort to get away from the evil incarnate. Soon everyone had exited the church except for one elderly gentleman who sat calmly on his pew without moving, seeming oblivious to the fact that God's ultimate en enemy was in his presence. So Satan walked up to the old man and said, Don't you know who I am? The man replied, Yep, sure do. Aren't you afraid of me? Satan asked. Nope, sure ain't, said the man. Don't you realize I can kill you with a word? Asked Satan. Don't doubt it for a minute, returned the old man in an even tone. Did you know that I could cause you profound, horrifying, physical agony for all eternity, persisted Satan? Yep, was the calm reply. And you're still not afraid, asked Satan. Nope. More than a little perturbed, Satan asked, Well, why? Aren't you afraid of me? The old man calmly replied, It's because I've been married to your sister for over 48 years. <laughs> well, there's a couple people got it. And I got the look, so... I guess that probably shouldn't have been shared. Please stand to your feet. And uh, as last week, we're going to, I'm going to give you the scriptures rather than to read them all to you because this is, uh, this is a long sermon. Uh, found in Matthew 21, 28 through 32. It's what's next from last week, of course. Uh, the Bible says this, but what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son... Go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They, the they are, are the scribes and the Pharisees, members of the Sanhedrin council. They said to him, the first... Jesus said to them, Assuredly, or verily, verily, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots did believe him. And when you saw it, and when you, saw it you did not afterward relent or repent and believe him. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the precious, infallible, in errant word of God. As we look into it this morning, I pray that you'd speak mightily to us, that you'd guide us and direct us, that the Holy Spirit of God would move uh, throughout this service. I pray that you'd touch hearts and touch lives. 
that we would be more like Jesus when we leave than when we were when we came. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The title of the, uh, the sermon this morning is Where the Rubber Meets the Road. And uh, I've heard that saying all my life. And uh, I've even said it a number of times. But I looked it up on uh, the internet to find out e its exact meaning according to what Google said. And uh, the subtitle of the sermon would be, Time to Get Serious. Time to Get Serious. Where the rubber meets the road. Jesus, in the last week of his life, was going back and forth to the temple, preaching and teaching the Word of God. And naturally, wherever he was, opposition was there. Amen? Wherever we go as true believers in the true body of Christ, I want you to know and think and realize that there's always going to be opposition. Amen? Okay, it's time to get wound up. There's always going to be opposition to the true cause of Jesus Christ. There's always going to be opposition. The last week of his life, as we read throughout the remainder part of Matthew's gospel, we're going to see encounter after encounter with those religious uh, stiff-necked individuals. Do you know, in my entire ministry, I've had few problems in, uh, from lost people in comparison to those stiff-necked, starchy, individualistic, uh, religious people that come in and they claim to be something uh, and claim to carry, or they carry the Bible, but they don't follow it. I have more problems out of those than I do a lost person. Why? Because that's just the way it is. Where the rubber meets the road. Jesus, last week, wanted to make sure that the message that was got out was a solid message. And he offered salvation and repentance and forgiveness to all that would listen to him. Even those people that opposed him the most. So today we want to talk about where the rubber meets the road. We don't know when our life is, will end, do we, friends? We don't know from one minute to the next, really. We don't live day to day. We live moment to moment. And so we need to make our lives count for the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. Are you making your lives count for the cause of Christ? I am so thankful, as, uh, as Brother Mike mentioned, that God's doing something here. Now, a man would have to be a complete uh, spiritual blind and deaf man to not know that God's not doing something here. Uh, there's great excitement uh, when people come in. It's not that long uh, lip dragging the ground and their eyes are, are, are just so sad looking. Most people that walk in are looking in with, uh, with great expectation on what is he going to do next. Amen? And I'm excited about that myself. It, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot uh, to get me excited. I'm one of those people that would shout at the drop of the hat. And I've got that invisible hat right here just waiting for God to give me a reason to shout. Amen? So listen, it's time for us to really get serious about this thing. If we're not serious, we need to get serious about our walk with Christ. Amen? About discipleship. Invest 2023. I believe I'm among a group of people that really do want to walk close to Jesus. And that makes me proud and it makes me happy and it makes me want to even walk closer to Him. Amen? So here this morning, I would like to just encourage you to get together with someone uh, and get together with folks often. Amen? Uh, I'm telling you, when Amanda stood up last week and said that the... The, the ladies the, said, once a month isn't enough. We want to start getting together and uh, have a Bible study and dive deep into what God says for us. Man, I wanted to jump up and shout then. I probably sinned by not doing it. Amen? But, but that's, that's a sign that, that uh, the church is going in the right direction. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're on social media, I'm sure you've probably heard about uh, there's a revival uh, in a university in Kentucky, Asbury 
University. It started on February the 8th, and they're still praising and uh, shouting, and people are getting saved, people are getting healed, people are getting delivered. Uh, this same campus held a revival, or there was actually a revival that broke out in 1970. But this one broke out 2023. Well, I, I'm, I'm amazed and thankful about those young college students experiencing revival, but uh, you don't have to go to Asbury. There's revival broke out here. Uh, I believe God is really doing something. Uh, so let me get on into the service uh, sermon, and, uh, uh, and, and we'll get out of here in just a little while. Uh, amen should not be $50 a piece this morning. Uh, if they are, we're going to be here a while. So you guys need to remember that. We need to make sure that we know that there are only two. There's right and there's wrong. Amen? There's no middle ground. There's either right or wrong. There's no little, there's no such thing as a little white lie. A lie is a lie. Can I get a witness? There's only male and female. Amen. There's no 620 different identities uh, such as society is trying to push on us. God knew exactly what he wanted you to be when he formed you in your mother's womb. And whatever or, or however you came out is how God wanted you to be. Amen. We can shake the fist into the face of God and say, no, that's not right. You made a mistake. All we want to, but God doesn't make mistakes. Amen. And God doesn't create junk. Amen. He created each of us unique and special to be a, that kind of a person for the kingdom of God to glorify him in everything that we do. God created two. There is saved and lost. You can't be sort of saved. Amen? You're either saved, you either know Christ as your personal Savior, or you don't. There is no hope so, or guess so, or maybe so, when it comes to salvation. Salvation is a no-so. Because I know Him. It's the reason I'm saved. Not because I'm a perfect individual. I get up here almost every Sunday and tell you that I'm not. I'm far from being that kind of a person. But I'm sort of like, or I'm not sort of, I am like those kids. I remember whenever I did go to church when I was small, we sung that song, He's Still Working on Me. And I'm glad as an almost 62-year-old man, I can stand up boldly before you and say, He's still working on me. Amen. Amen? I, I'm not perfect, but I'm saved. And I'm saved because I know Him. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the reason a person is saved. If a person does not know Him and have that relationship with Him, then they're not Saved. You can you can know all the Bible uh, that there is and still die and go to hell. Matter of fact, the ones that gave Jesus the biggest problem carried the scrolls under their arm. They, matter of fact, had the Bible me memorized the mo uh, most part, but they still didn't know the author. Amen. I'm glad I know the author. Then the bi Bible declares that you're saved or lost. There is obedient and disobedient. Church family, there's obedient and disobedient. You can't be a little bit obedient. As we read in this text, there was the, the person, the son that was obedient. There was the son that was disobedient. Right? So you can't be a little obedient or a little disobedient. You're either all in or you're not. Amen? Amen. There is heaven and hell. Right? That's the only two places that there are that will be eternal is heaven and hell. There is no temporary place like some teach. That's not scriptural. There is no place in the Bible that mentions, okay, you live a pretty good life. This is what I'm going to do for you, God says. 
I'm going to cast you into this place and you're going to stay there for a little while, depending on how bad you are. And that's where your sins will be purged. And then you can come on up to heaven. If that was the truth, who got you into heaven? You did. Because you endured the punishment. I'm here to tell you, if that was the case, then Jesus would never have had to die. There was a blood sacrifice that was required, and Jesus paid our sin debt. Here in this text, we see two distinct groups of people, the obedient and the disobedient. And that was what separated them. One was religious, the other was not. Isn't it amazing that the ones who were disobedient were the religious people? Isn't that amazing? It was the religious crowd that, that was the disobedient. And those who were the obedient were the ones that didn't know anything or very much about God. We better be careful today not to allow the same pride to get in our way that the scribes and Pharisees did. We must keep our eyes focused on the cross. And that was the price that was paid for us. Keep our eyes on the cross. And we need to keep our eyes on the Christ, the one who died for us, or we'll end up in that same prideful boat. Three things I'd like to share with you really quick about where the rubber meets the road in, according to the text that we just read. First of all, the message went out to all. The same commandment that the Father gave went out to both the religious and the unreligious. It went out to everybody. The message still goes out and is applicable to all. Amen? The message went out for all. Listen to what Scripture says, uh, Matthew 21, 28 through 30. But what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work in the, uh, today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I'll not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Now, it doesn't say the in-between time. If this was me and the father in the picture was my dad, I know why I went. Yeah. The sound of that belt coming through seven belt loops was the reason that I would have went. But Scripture just says, he said, go. And he says, no, nah, I'm not going. But then he repented. In other words, he turned, right? He turned from his former action. I'm not going, turned, I am going. I'm going here, but I ended up here. That's what salvation is. You're headed down the wrong path. When God intervenes and convicts you, then you make that turn and you head towards God. Amen? Isn't that great? I'll not, but then he regretted, and he came to the second and said, likewise, he said the same thing. Son, I want you to go work in the vineyard. And he said, I'm going to go. But then he didn't. The man didn't go. No one is outside the message of God. No one is outside God's message. There is none that God is not able to save. Amen? There is no church member that's so hard-headed that they can't immediately move to the point of obedience on what God would have them to do. You're never too late to be used of God. Amen? Does anybody know how old Moses was before God said, I want to use you? He was 80 years old. He spent the first 40 years of his life learning to be a somebody, to be a prince in Egypt. The second 40 years of his life, he spent to be a nobody cattleman on the backside of the Midian desert. That's when God said, I can use you. No one's outside of the message of God. There's no one that's too old. There is none that are too young to be used of God. One of the greatest revivals that ever broke out in Israel started because a king that was eight years old ascended to the throne. Eight years old. A number of years passed I think about 10 years, he may have been 18, when they come to him and said, you won't believe what we found when we was cleaning out the temple. What did you find? We found the Bible. Now, it wasn't the Bible. It was the scrolls. 
And they said, and this is where it was at whenever we found it. And we think we might ought to give you a report on what it said. Whenever King Josiah heard the word of God, it broke his heart. He rent his garment and he started destroying idols and things. And they had a great revival. No one is outside of the message of God. The first step, oh, wait a minute, no one's outside the message of God, that God desires us to repent and be saved. That's the first step. Amen? That's the message of God. If you're not a Christian, the first step in your life, as far as God is concerned with you, is for you to repent. You're going one direction, God wants you to turn and go the other. And the coolest thing is that God will turn you. All you got to do is say, I need, I want to turn, just like Josh said. I'm sick of this, Lord. I know it's not right in your sight. Please help me with it. And next thing you know, hey, it's pretty cool. Yeah. That's the first step. The second step is that he wants to transform us into the likeness of his son. That's step number two. And then step number three is that uh, he wants us to live with him forever in perfect fellowship. Those three steps are called salvation. Sanctification is where God's still working on us, making us into the image of his son. And then the last step is what I'm waiting on with great anticipation on bated breath, and that is glorification. When God changes this old mortal body into the immortal that will, where we'll live with him forever. Listen to what uh, the message is to all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is such a great deep message in John 3.16. Listen to what John 3, 17 said. For God didn't send his, word, his son into the world to condemn the world, but that uh, the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the only name, uh, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants all the lost to come to him. It's not his will that any should perish, but it is his will that everyone would come to repentance. So the message went to all. Second of all, the meaning of the message was clear. No one in Jesus' audience that day were found scratching their head going, what did he mean by that? The message is clear, isn't it? The message I just proclaimed to you a second ago, is it not a clear one? That God wants everyone saved and he wants the saved to live in obedience? Amen? He wants us to walk uprightly before him. He wants us to love him with all of our heart and love one another. Amen? With a great love. That's God's desire for us. That is the, the message, and the meaning of the message is clear. No one that goes to hell is going to say, you know, God, I really didn't understand what it took to get here. Because the message is that clear. God did not hide the message in such a manner that somebody could would stumble over and end up uh, dying and going to, going to hell. The message is that Jesus Christ came to this world, bled and died, and he rose from the death, uh, from the dead three days later. And now is ascended to, to God the Father, make an intercession for everyone that will call on his name. What does intercession mean, preacher? I'm so glad you asked. Whenever you pray, God, Jesus hears it and says, God forgive. And it's forgiven. Amen. The message, the meaning of the message was clear. Matthew 21, 28 through 30. Uh, again, uh, the last part of verse 28. Son, go work today in my vineyard. That boy did not have to wonder. What did dad just say? He told him, right? Go work in my vineyard. Then verse 30. He came to the second end said likewise. The message was to both of them and the message was clear. 
The message for today is to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And this message is very clear too. John 6, 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Romans 3, verses 9 through 23. You guys just write that down, and you can... Uh, Look it up at some other point uh, today or whenever. But I want to focus on verse 23. Scripture says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not one person sitting in this audience today or standing behind this pulpit that, is, that was not found guilty before God for sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news, right? That is the bad news, is that all have fallen short. The message is clear. Who's the sinner here? Amen? You really believe that? If you believe that, then you also need to believe that you need help with that. Amen? The help is... The same for everyone. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. There's only one, right? The means one. I am the truth and I am the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Who comes to the Father? Who can go to the Father except through Christ? What does that mean in essence? It means everyone needs Jesus. Everyone needs to receive his sacrifice that he made on the cross. Peter preached this in Acts 2, chapter 36 through 40. Therefore, let all the house of Israel uh, know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, only one, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard it, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified it and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. The message is clear. Message went to all. And so if it went, if, it, if the message is to all, it can be applied by all. Right? No good to have a message if you can't apply it. Right? But I know how Satan works. If so-and-so was here, would they be getting their wagon loaded? Well, guess who knew who would be here? The author of the sermon. You ain't, you ain't talking about me because I don't even know if I'm going to be here from day to day. Never know if you're sick or anything like that, do you? The author of the message is, was the Lord. And he knew exactly who would be here. And he knew that we would need to hear this message. The last point. Y'all can grin. The last point in the message today is the moral of the message. The message was clear message was applicable to all, right? Well, what's the moral of the story? Or what's the moral of the message? There needs to be a moral to it, right? What shall I, what can I, what do I need to do with this message? The moral of the message is that religion will get a person into hell. But a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through our obedience to the Lord will give us heaven. Period. No ifs, ands, and buts. Religion will merit a person hell, but a relationship with Christ through our obedience to the Lord, through His Holy Word, will give us heaven and will merit us the victorious life, church. Obedience to the Word of God will also grant us the victorious life when we're found in obedience to what God says to us now. Y'all agree with that? You believe it? 
Do you believe that you'll have absolute victory if you walk in the Spirit by being obedient to the Word of God? Amen. Righteousness. Well, actually, let's look at look and see what Scripture says, verse 31 and 32. Which of the two men, Jesus looked at the religious people, the ones that he just talked to. He said, which of these two, the one that said, I'm not going, and then turned around and went, or the one that said, I will go, and didn't? It's good to have... Uh, um, Can't even remember what I was going to say now. Hmm. Oh, anyhow, uh, there was two people. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, the first, Jesus said to them, Surely I say to you that the tax collectors and harlots will enter the kingdom of God before you. Those were the most despicable people uh, through the eyes of these religious people that Jesus could have mentioned. He said, these, these two classes of people are going to go into the, uh, heaven and you're not. Because you're holding on to pride and religion versus a relationship with Almighty God. For John, that's John the Baptist, came to you in the way of righteousness. He preached righteousness to you and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you even saw that happen, you didn't afterwards go and repent and believe what John was saying. That's something. That's the moral of the story. What is righteousness? Righteousness is to be in right standing with God. Are you? If I were to ask you one at a time, if we were going to my office and I'd say, if I was to look at you and I was to say, are you in right standing with God? What would your answer be? To be in right standing with God. Well, how is it accomplished? Is it accomplished through our own works and deeds? Is that how a person gains righteousness? Do good works? Shake the preacher's hand? Visit the widows? Visit the sick? Is that, is that how a person obtains righteousness? Is it? No, it's not. It might be an, as far as society is concerned. A person can look at any of you folks and say you're good people. And as far as society is concerned, they're telling the truth, right? If we're measuring ourselves up against society, but is that where the measuring stick lies? Who is the final say and if we're righteous or not? Amen. It's not through our own works or deeds. It's only found in the finished work of Christ as he shed his atoning blood for us. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is only one group of people who God has declared righteous. And those are the ones who place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a litmus test for righteousness. Because I thought I was a good person before I got saved. If somebody had come to me and they, before I got saved and said, Are you a good person? I would say, yes, I'm a good person. I go to work every day. I'm faithful. I do this. I do that. Now, you couldn't have caught me within a country mile of the church. But in my mind, I was still a good person. I was gauging myself up against this person or that person. The people I chose to gauge myself up against, right? I didn't want to look at people I thought were to gauge my righteousness by. If you would have asked me, that would have been the answer that I would have given. However, I couldn't have been further from the truth because righteousness isn't measured by man, but by God himself. In man's eyes, I guess that I was a good as the next guy, but in God's eyes, I was found guilty in breaking his commandments and deemed a sinner which the end result, end result is deserving of hell. Romans 6, 23, the very first part of that verse says, for the wages of sin is death. Okay? God's measuring stick for righteousness is found in Numbers chapter 20, the Old Testament. And that is a very simple 
this many. God says, if you want to be righteous, then you have to follow all of these. This is my standard. You can do that, then you, then I will say that you are a righteous person. God says that. This is my standard of righteousness. Not Sandra, not myself, not Pastor Ron, not, not the king sitting back there. We're not God's standard. Amen? Because honestly, in different areas, you're probably living better than what I am. Or these guys. But we're not your standard to be measured against. God's standard is found in 10. That's his perfect measuring stick. And if you want to be declared righteous by God, you have to be found not guilty of any of the ten. Okay? If you're found guilty of even one, according to James 2.10, God says you're guilty of all of them. Okay? If you're guilty of at least one. So this should let you know where you stand. If you're here and you're not a Christian... I want you to play, pay very close attention to these next words of Scripture that we're going to have on the screen. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. You shall have no other gods before me. I don't know any one person that has, that has ever made it by commandment one. At one time or another, we've all pushed God to the side and inserted something else in front of him in this area or that area in our life. That's what that means. If there's anything more important to you at any given moment or second in your life than me, then you broke commandment number one. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. That's called an idol. Right? Do we have them? Don't have to physically get on your knees before them to idolize. Verse 5, You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I... The Lord your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Verse 7 and 8. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Guilty is charged. That's, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you add something to God's name. I don't know many people that's not ever at least done that. But that means taking his name lightly or out of context in any way, shape, or form. Somebody say something and you, you just throw his name out there. How often do you hear that on television? How often have we done it ourselves? Guilty as charged? For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. Exodus 20 verses 12 through 17. Commandment 5. Honor your father and mother. That your days may be long upon the earth. Which the Lord God has given you. How many of us have dishonored our parents in one way or another. Over our lifetime. Verse 13. You shall not murder. The Bible says if you hate somebody without a cause. You're guilty of murder. You shall not commit adultery. Jesus said if we look upon the opposite sex with lust in our heart, we have committed adultery with them already in our heart. You shall not steal. Even taking a pencil home from work that doesn't belong to you or anything like that. If it's not yours, don't pick it up. You shall not bear false witness. Or in other words, you shouldn't lie. Some of us probably lied before we came to church this morning. Husbands. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. In other words, you shouldn't want them. You should not want that stuff so much you're willing to do anything to get it. So if we found ourselves guilty uh, with these, then God says you're not righteous. Right? And you have to be righteous to get to heaven. We need help. James 2.10, I think it should be coming up soon. Uh, Whosoever shall keep the whole law, but stumble in one point, you're guilty of it all, the Bible says. So the brass tax is this. As I painstakingly read those Ten Commandments to you, Scripture tells us why God put them there. Why the Ten Commandments is there. Scripture tells us in the New Testament why God said this anyhow. You know why? Was it to beat us down? Because you didn't keep this, so whack. You didn't do that, whack. No, the, the book of Galatians tells us why the Ten Commandments are there. Whenever you read it and you say it, to yourself, guilty as charged. Guilty. Well, that means I'm not righteous. Galatians tells us that the law was put in place as a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ. Jesus, I can't do this on my own. I need you to stand in my place. Because in my own righteousness, I'll perish. Will you please stand up for me whenever it, my name is called and the books are open? Jesus, will you stand in for me? I trust that you bled and died for me. So when it comes my time, will you please stand up for me? The law was meant to show us, hey, we fall very short of God's standard. But then comes grace and mercy in the form of his son, who willingly bled and died to take my place. I'm not afraid of dying. I have 100% confidence that I'm going to go to heaven. You know why? Because he is going to stand up for me. There's no, play, no person in this building that needs him worse than me. And I assure you, he's going to stand up for me. And if you have got your faith in him, he's going to stand up for you. And if you've not placed your faith in him, I beg you, please place your faith in him that he will stand in your stead. Amen. Amen. And he will do it. The moral of the story is we're all lawbreakers. We're all sinners. And we all need a Savior. Amen? Church, we're all in disobedient, uh, of disobedience in one area or another in our lives. And today, don't harden your hearts when Holy Spirit comes by you and says, Okay, it's time for us to do business. Be obedient to me, and I'm going to change you today. I'm going to make you more like Jesus if you'll just listen to me and turn your heart towards me in that area that we've been talking about for some time. Amen. Please stand. I guarantee you that by our own worship team, come on up. I guarantee you that by our own admission, we can honestly say that none of us can claim that we haven't broken at least one of the Ten Commandments which makes us all not righteous in God's eyes. Therefore, we're declared a sinner. And as scripture uh, that I just shared a few minutes ago shows us that the wages of sin is death. We need help in the form of a Savior. That's why Jesus came. Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now, when? No condemnation. How much? None, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of, uh, uh, of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what I could not do, that and I was weak through the flesh, God did it by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's why I get excited about Jesus. He thought enough of us that he willingly laid down his life. The innocent for the guilty. The righteous for the unrighteous. The sinless for the sinner. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Bow with me. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to come into the house of God. To hear the praises from your people. And thank you for the word of God. Now as we approach this invitation time. Holy Spirit, thank you that you do your best work. And I just pray that you would move on hearts and lives. Give us the boldness, the courage to step out to help you to make a change in us. To make us more like Christ. For my dear brother or sister that's not a Christian, today, Father, I pray that as you showed them through your perfect standard that they're guilty. I pray that they could see a bleeding and dying Savior that loved them and gave his life for them, and that they will receive him by faith as their Lord and Savior. I pray that that would happen today. But Lord, we know that you know what you're doing. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.